this is Talking Europe on France 24 and it has been a very busy week for Europe and for France. We've finally gotten a formal idea of why the Gilets Jaunes protesters are so angry and what many of them want to happen next. This in the shape of a report on a great national debate organised by the government over recent weeks. Preparations also ramping up for the European Parliament election in May. That includes the United Kingdom formally beginning its preparations for that election, despite all sides having said for weeks that they don't want the UK to actually take part. I ought to add that we are recording this programme before we know exactly which way the Brexit process is going. Uh, with us to talk over some of the big concerns for France and Europe at this turbulent time is Jean-Claude Trichet, former president of the European Central Bank, before that governor of the Bank of France, now chairman of the Bruegel Think Tank. Thank you very much for being with us again on Front Talking Europe. It's a pleasure. Let's start by talking Brexit. Uh, the UK has once again avoided a no-deal exit. Uh, preparations had very much been happening, been paid for on both sides, though, uh, it seems that perhaps no deal would have just been a leap too far into the unknown. I hope very much that no deal uh, will not be, uh, I would say, the, at the end of this short period of time. Mm. And nobody expects that, really, I, I think. That being said, uh, we must have the UK deciding. I mean, the UK is divided to an extent which is unbelievable. Uh, not only the parliament is uh, divided, the government is divided, the cabinet is divided, the country itself, mm. England on, on the one side, uh, side uh, Scotland and, and uh, Northern Ireland on the other side, when you look at the results. So, again, it is the UK which has to decide, as simple as that. In terms of the economic impact, your specialist area, of course, do you foresee a negative economic impact on Europe of allowing Brexit and all the uncertainty to continue via a longer extension? Well, of course, it's better from the economic standpoint that the no deal, which uh, will have a big, big influence, uh, big negative influence, either, both on the UK and on uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, that being said, uh, clearly, Uncertainty is no good for the economy in general, for investors in particular, for the uh, economic agents. So it would be very bad to continue to have uncertainty on what is likely to happen. At a time, you have to be in a more certain universe. I hope very much that there will be a deal. Uh, and uh, uh, the deal is much better than no deal. Uh, still, of course, you have to decide. Mm. And the decision remains entirely in the hands of the UK democracy, which was the exemplary representative democracy historically, and uh, which is demonstrating today, and it's mm. dramatic, that representative democracy does not function well anymore. And it is at the very place where it was born. Would it perhaps be better, considering all the uncertainty, uh, for the EU27 to perhaps just let the UK go and make a clean break now? There have been arguments in favour of that uh, here in France in recent weeks. Well, there they have been arguments all over Europe, I have to say, to say we, we are exasperated by this uh, uh, incapacity uh, of the United Kingdom to decide. But I don't trust that uh, even if you are unnerved by the situation and the permanent call for new delay and so forth, uh, nevertheless, you will not play the game of the worst. And uh, I, uh, I would not like, of course, at all, that the emotion, which is now uh, widespread in the, amongst the 27, would call them to take a decision which would not be optimal. You and I spoke almost exactly a year ago. Much has happened since then, including here in France, uh, the country being rocked by months of these uh, weekly gilets jaunes protests. Uh, did that take you by surprise, just first of all? Well, I think that uh, all, all observers were uh, taken by surprise, obviously. There is no doubt on that. That being said, when I look at the advanced democracy and the, the problem they have, say, populism, as we say today, I see uh, President Trump in the US, I see Brexit in the UK, I see uh, the extreme right in Germany, I see the new government in Italy, and the yellow vest for me are uh, something like uh, the French uh, illustration, the French uh, emblematic illustration of uh, this kind of frustration of a large part of our uh, fellow citizens 
in the advanced economy. So this is something which is very serious. And what is important is to understand why mm. and to understand what is the appropriate response, of course, to this frustration. I mentioned in the introduction to the programme, the government's embarked on this national listening exercise that they called the, the Grand Débat, the Great Debate. Uh, I'd like to give you and our viewers just a couple of statistics that have come out of that. Uh, nearly two million answers and comments were made online at granddebat.fr. Over 27,000 letters and emails sent in. More than 16,000 town halls made comment books available to the public. There were over 10,000 local meetings and they drew in nearly half a million participants. Now, uh, the Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, gave a summary of the results of all of this in recent days. Uh, let's just watch this report together. For three months, the French nation had its say and the government now says it's listened. On Monday, under the glass roof of Paris's Grand Palais, the findings of the Grand Debat were made clear to see. We have reached a situation where hesitating would be worse than making a mistake. It would be wrong. The need for change is so radical that any conservatism and any timidity would be unforgivable. Some 1.5 million French voters took part in the deliberations, either online or at one of 10,000 town hall meetings held up and down the country. The frustrations expressed during those debates fall into four categories, which Edouard Philippe has pledged to tackle. Participants believe there are too many taxes and public spending is too high. The disparities between Paris and France's regions and territories should be reduced, and the very notion of direct democracy needs to be bolstered. Voters also want more to be done to address climate change. Crucially, two of the Yellow Vest's key demands, namely the reintroduction of a wealth tax and the introduction of popular votes allowing citizens to suggest laws, did not feature in the Prime Minister's speech. The government's opponents say the response is just an old record they've heard many times before. All that Edouard Philippe has done here is confirm his government's wishes and the policies they pursued for the past two years. With the flame of Yellow Vest discontent still flickering, Philippe addressed both Houses of Parliament after the big reveal. The Prime Minister confirmed President Macron will soon set out the next economic measures his government wants to take. Jean-Claude Trichet, uh, just one of the main points to take out of that. The French want fairer taxes, what they see as fairer taxes. Uh, the Prime Minister mainly talked about reducing taxes for ordinary people and talked about also how that would mean cutting public spending. He didn't, though, talk about raising taxes uh, for the wealthy or for big corporations. Do you think perhaps the government has missed the point here? Uh, we will see exactly what is the response. The response will be given by the President of the Republic. And uh, what we heard was the summing up of uh, the request coming from uh, the, uh, those people that have expressed their views. Uh, by the way, it was an absolutely fantastic uh, way of uh, dialoguing, di dialoguing with the uh, fellow citizens uh, in uh, circumstances which are very exceptional. Uh, the, the main problem of France is mass unemployment. That is the French anomaly that we are living with practically since the first oil shock, so mm. since a very long period of time. And uh, the clear responsibility of the government since the very beginning was to say, we have to reform France in order to have progressively full employment, mm. because uh, mass unemployment is a, a cancer. Yeah, it's 8.8% so, so, on the uh, latest figures. Uh, I would say uh, what I understand from, uh, from the government is that uh, they want to echo a lot of things which have been said by uh, the people of France and at the same time not put in jeopardy the uh, fight against mass unemployment, mm. which was really uh, the goal from the very beginning. In terms of uh, uh, taxation, if you are taxing even more a lot of people in France that are already tempted to go abroad because taxation is too high from them, then you fight uh, uh, pro uh, unemployment. Mm. You are giving uh, more unemployed in France. If you, the people, again, that are uh, entrepreneurs or uh, that are, uh, cap are able to finance new ventures, uh, create new jobs, mm. are going abroad. And 
there is not a single country uh, immediately out of the French borders where you have, for instance, a taxation of the wealthy people, which is as high as mm. in France. So that's a problem. Uh, on the other hand, you have a lot of requests for uh, the middle class mm. and uh, that are uh, certainly uh, that will uh, have a response, in my opinion, uh, when the decisions are taken and expressed by the president. So I expect a lot of things to be said and I expect that they will not hamper the fight against mass unemployment, mm. which is decisive in France. It certainly is. But on the, on the issue of purchasing power, this is, of course, a, a rich country. Uh, there is economic growth here, predicted to be twice as strong as Germany in 2019. Uh, so in that context, surely it's just not right that so many people are really feeling the pinch in their pockets to the extent uh, that's been expressed by many of these people taking part in that great debate. I mean, there is not a single country in the world where those who are at the minimum wage level would not say it's much too low. So I think uh, we can all understand uh, such requests. It is absolutely clear that they are, from the standpoint of uh, those who are in uh, that situation, fully legitimate, understandable. That being said, again, our main problem is mass unemployment. <laughs> and we have mass unemployment in particular because the... Uh, unit labor cost, if I may, the cost uh, in general for the French productive sector is too high. Mm. That's the problem. Well, I'd like to move on to some of the, the broader issues uh, regarding the European elections now, uh, coming up on May 23rd to 26th. They've been billed as the most important European elections ever. President Macron has said that this is the time to turn a page on a new Europe. Uh, considering that turnout is projected to be between 40-45% once again, isn't that a bit ambitious? Well, uh, the, it's, a, it's again a problem that we all have. If you look at the United States of America, you'll see that the uh, number of uh, fellow citizens that are voting is also very, very low. So mm. it's, a, it's a problem we all have. I think that what is not sufficiently known is that the trust of the European in their own European Parliament is significantly higher than the trust they have in their national parliament. I was very impressed myself with the figures. The European Parliament has 48% of trust and 39 of no trust, which is plus 9% for mm. the European Parliament. And if you take all the national parliaments and all the citizens of the European Union, it is only 35% of trust for their national parliament and 58 of no trust, so minus 23% to be compared to plus 9. So, you know, the idea that the European Parliament uh, has no uh, importance, uh, that uh, no, nobody pay any attention to the European Parliament, seems to me uh, wrong from this Eurobarometer standpoint survey. Uh, that being said, of course, uh, I would hope that the turnover would be much higher. Mm. Well, there is another prediction uh, which seems to go contrary to that statistic you just quoted. Uh, this idea that uh, this election could see quite a wave of populists uh, and, and more far right and more extreme political elements coming into the European Parliament. And President Macron again said this is the battle of pro populists and progressives. Um, I mean, is he right to do that? It seems to be raising the stakes. Uh, again, we will see. We are we're living in democracies. I would say, uh, in many respects, when you look at the rest of the world, in exemplary democracies in Europe, and uh, it is normal that all sensitivities are represented in the national parliaments as well as in the European Parliament. Uh, well, coming back to the economy, I'm very interested in the link between the economy and voting. There was a report uh, recently that the, the French economist Thomas Piketty, for, for example, contributed to. It was saying that uh, inequality in France had sharply increased in the last decade, uh, widening social inequality. And there was a, a Swedish study that came out around the same time that <clears throat> linked widening social inequality with a greater trend for voting for the extremes. Are we perhaps at this point in 2019 seeing the impact of a, a decade of austerity and, and belt tightening playing out uh, with, with voters, uh, you know, looking for, for different places to cast their votes? I don't think that when you look at the famous Gini coefficient, uh, namely a measure, an objective measure of inequalities, you'll have most European countries, most continental European countries on the side of these uh, countries that are uh, very unequal amongst the uh, advanced uh, democracies 
advanced economy. The US is mm. much uh, an outlier with a lot of inequality, and they have augmented considerably under the work of... Uh, and the Thomas rich are seen getting richer as Thomas well. Thomas Piketty has been uh, very much on, on the United States of America, uh, undoubtedly. In France, I would say the redistribution is very, very important and has contributed to reduce the level of, the, of inequality. The problem is... Uh, not necessarily only the objective inequality in comparison with all the other countries. And France is probably a case in point. It is the sentiment of inequality, mm. the perception. And the perception of inequality uh, out of, uh, on top of the uh, objective inequality, which is not documented, I have to say, it seems to me, in Scandinavia or in France or uh, in a number of European countries, uh, but still uh, the perception of inequality with the transparency of uh, of all, uh, I would say, our societies is uh, certainly has certainly augmented, uh, and it's a real, real issue. One of the issues that uh, uh, frustrated our fellow citizens and has to be, uh, I would say, addressed. Well, perhaps by, by, it's it's the major problem. The major problem mm. of all advanced economy, the major political problem, is to respond to the frustration of a significant part of our population. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But Jean-Claude Trichet, thank you very much for coming in to see us on Talking It was a pleasure. Thanks to you as well for watching, as always. Uh, do remember, you can catch our other programmes online at France24.com. We'll see you soon here on Talking Europe. Here at France 24, we're taking a broad outlook by talking about the women who are reshaping our world. In France 24, in Spanish, we don't have themes vedados. And that can be seen on TV and on all the platforms that we have on the internet. We're France 24, and we're going to talk to you about the events that we have in the heart of the events before you enter 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 the events before you Claro que tiene algo especial, somos todos de distintos países y trabajamos con todo el corazón para entregar información en el momento preciso. We may be in Paris, but here on France 24, we very much have Europe on our minds, especially in the lead up to the European elections that President Macron has built as a clash between progressives and populists. Join me and our teams on France 24 as we travel the continent meeting everyone from first time voters to big name candidates in debates, live coverage and more, a host of European flavoured specials in the run up to the big vote. Join us on France 24 and France24.com.